Okay, um, so this is actually uh, kind of a continuation of your talk this morning, David. <laughs> You're joking, right? Um, so uh, this is actually kind of a two-part talk. So I'm gonna I'm gonna start uh, with an overview. Um, mostly, this is about uh, developing a, a real offload in infrastructure in Linux. And then Felipe is going to follow, uh, giving kind of the compiler angle, which uh, we believe is critical to it. Okay, so I want to up-level it for just a minute. Um, there's actually a general umbrella problem here. And for lack of a better, better term, we'll call those domain-specific accelerators. And the idea is we're getting to the point where we need to apply hardware uh, acceleration in the data path. So offload is one example of that, but you can imagine in programmable devices or NPUs, we have to offload or ac accelerate certain um, hardware, uh, certain functions. So this is actually a general term, and if you look it up, domain-specific accelerators, there's quite a bit of work. Uh, a lot of it is literally domain specific. So some people have built accelerators, for instance, when they're mapping the human genome, they actually built hardware very specific to that problem. So when we think about networking though, it's a little bit broader of a domain, but it's still a domain, um, typically not the application. But usually we think of networking as infrastructure. So the scope is, like I said, pretty broad. Um, I don't think, believe, I, I, I couldn't find any use of this term, domain-specific accelerators for networking when I Googled it. So it might be a little new, but some of the concepts, obviously, uh, people are gonna be quite familiar with. Fuck it. So scope, uh, manifestations, use cases, uh, system design. So I'll get into the man manifestations in a bit, uh, minute. but. Some of the key factors, how do we integrate software and hardware? Uh, this is absolutely key across the board. Uh, one way to think of domain-specific accelerator is they're accelerating, in the end of the day, probably some software uh, or integrated into a software solution. They are inherently hardware, so the hardware interfaces become uh, critical. And probably the key point, and really the enabler of this technology and why we can even talk about it today is these really need to be programmable. Having a fixed function acceleration going forward is going to be more and more difficult uh, to scale. And we'll see why that is, especially when we look at uh, the plight of some of the offloads. So we can also look at um, the, the scope in terms of functionality. And I would claim it's from the mundane, which, uh, you know, measly checks some offload that we've been trying to do for 25 years uh, with mixed success, I'll get into that, uh, all the way to the ornate. So yesterday we had a great presentation on Falcon, Ultra Ethernet. Those are obviously very complex protocols, explicitly designed for hardware. Uh, but believe it or not, I, I think there's a commonality across the board in terms of how we deal with this. Uh, obviously, it's better if we have one common framework or one common solution that covers all this number of use cases as opposed to having to reinvent the wheel every time somebody comes up with something new. Uh, proximity is also interesting. I was thinking about this today. So um, when we think about an AI ML rack, sometimes one meter is the distances we have to worry about networking. Uh, and then later on this week, uh, we're actually going to talk about interplanetary networking, so that's 225 million kilometers. So very small to extremely big. Again, what are the commonalities? What can we leverage and programming model and things like that? Uh, the goal is pretty kind of obvious in a sense. So acceleration, a lot of people means performance, um, but power, definitely a, a reason. So uh, on a mobile phone, for instance, um, we may accelerate by offloading stuff to a, a lower power CPU explicitly for power, not necessarily for performance. And then, of course, cost is critical. So everybody's concerned about the uh, cost of their data center and et cetera. 
and all of the above. So the fundamental point is, though, I believe we're getting to a point where software can't solve all the problems. And we have to start integrating hardware more and more into the solution. So I'm going to give uh, one shout out. Um, this is a uh, comment from Jesse. I think it was my favorite comment from NetDev17. Uh, still looking for the one from NetDev18. But uh, high speed Ethernet is the only asynchronously, by surprise, received traffic high speed IO device. So it's an interesting. Interesting point, and the way I think about this is sometimes I look at at networking um, and I haven't been doing it for a while. Uh, sometimes it seems kind of like we haven't made an progress compared to some others. So my son, for instance, is uh, starting his graduate studies um, in video games in University of Utah. I went to a video game um, senior thesis. And it was mind blowing. These kids are making these video games, three dimensions, multi layer. Um, they have co interfaces and sound. You know, that's great. I come to NetDev conference. The best we have are some some slides with uh, static graphs. So, a little bit interesting. I'm not saying it's boring, but this is really why that is. Networking is the last bastion of completely random, non deterministic input. We have to be prepared for everything. That is what makes us a hard problem. And that's why um, you know, most networking developers know we spend 90% of the, or 10% of the time making something work and then 90% making it work well. So love that quote. Um, you might be uh, on the next uh, slide deck if you make a good quote this, not them. So manifestations uh, of DSA, domain specific accelerators. So I think we can categorize them in three classes. So one is offload, which is really what we normally think about in Linux. Uh, offload through a network device, uh, send a packet, uh, send data with it uh, to have instructions to do checksum or um, TSO or whatever. Um, but there's a couple of other ones. Uh, we can also think of accelerated accelerator instructions. So if I have a CPU. One of the nice things we can do, if, if it's extensible, is add instructions explicitly for uh, certain uh, network domain specific functions. Um, kind of like vector instructions, but if you think in terms of networking, uh, simplistically, we could have a, an optimized checksum instruction. But you can take that farther. Uh, one of the things we're working on is a set of parser instructions. Uh, so from a CPU, you could parse. Uh, the advantage of that, by the way, is when you create an instruction, the programming model is really simple. Usually you put these behind a library and it just works. The downside of instructions is, well, I have to get them into the CPU. That's a, a long pull. Um, in our case, though, actually RISC-V really is enabling that when you have an open ISA um, kind of flipping things upside down so we can actually add instructions. The other one is what I call accelerator, accelerator engines. These, the way I think about it is, is say you have a uh, accelerator engine, like a crypto engine. Usually in networking, we have to think of that as being part of the, the send path or receive path in the device. But what if you could take that out and make it standalone? So from a program, say running in user space or in, even in the kernel, what if you could call into this accelerator function and say, encrypt this block of data? So I like to think of it as more of an RPC type of acceleration. Uh, it, and of course, you, you want that for compression, encryption, hashes, so the whole bunch. The problem with this um, in terms of uh, trying to use it from a general purpose OS, the isolation security models, um, also how to get it fast enough for the scheduling, really difficult. So. On a commodity OS, uh, like Linux running on a server, uh, offload seems to be the simplest one, and we'll focus on that one today. Uh, if I have more na uh, narrower environment, uh, own some of the conditions, then I can get into this. And 
Uh, one example here, for instance, these, these could actually be cores on a smart neck, and then I can take advantage of this more direct acceleration. So that's the high-level uh, domain specific accelerator for networking. What I want to talk about today is really the offload. The other two uh, we are presenting in, in other forms. Uh, the accelerator instructions will probably take the RISC V consortium uh, and accelerator engines. We're looking to see if OCP is interested in that. So offload, though, um, basic way to phrase it, we run part of the data path usually in hardware. And everybody's familiar with uh, the basic NIC offload. So we have uh, your GSO, TSO, uh, checksum, uh, even RSS, and you go up a little bit, TC Flower, and you can keep going, uh, TLS, and keep going, TCP, and keep going, RDMA with full-blown TCP. Uh, there's a whole gamut of them. All of those, uh, in some sense, are offload. The API is, in a way, straightforward. Uh, as far as I can tell, all, all offloads, both receive and transmit, operate on a tail call type of system. So on transmit, create a transmit descriptor, give it the instructions on the offload, push it down into the device on a transmit ring, and then the sender basically forgets about it. There, there's really no response. Uh, so you're doing a tail call into the device, and the device takes over and presumably does all of the uh, work and whatever the offloads are to send the packet. You see side is sort of the same thing, except it starts at the receiver. So receive side gets a packet and may apply various offloads, let's say checksum offload or GRO. So it applies those, and then it sends up the packet into the host. Again, that's like a tail call. And in this case, it gives information attached to the receive descriptor describing what has actually results of the offload. So it's always uh, a two-phase process. So one phase is on the host or in the device, the other phase is on the other one. Uh, so that's kind of a, a base model. And obviously, uh, memory movement and uh, all the functionality, combining that with GPU, all of that has to be taken into account in the API. So the advantages, uh, relatively easy programming model. Uh, the, especially if you're going through the kernel, the kernel takes care of security and iso resource isolation. Uh, like we talked about this morning, um, do want to support uh, kernel bypass. Uh, a little trickier. Um, we have to we have to still maintain the same uh, security measures. Uh, the disadvantages I mentioned the all or nothing. Uh, I can't access a crypto engine in a NIC just to do memory to memory encryption. It would be cool. Um, but we really can't do that. So we don't have that granularity of access to subfunctions. So all that being said, um, I'm going to make a claim that for all the work we've done in Linux for network offload, it's actually been pretty disappointing. Uh, there's several reasons for that, but we don't have a lot of ubiquitous offloads. Uh, even the even the even the core one checksum offload uh, we're going to talk about today. It's, there's still problems with it. Usually, I think the problem is um, disconnects between the software and the offload. Uh, software software wants to do an offload, but it's thinking properties of the offload. If the hardware does not match what the software expects, we have a disconnect. And the problem that we've seen a lot with offloads is these sort of disconnects, they can be really subtle, uh, like almost all the time, everything works fine. But sometimes, very rare, uh, things really go south. I, I remember one case where we were trying to get uh, packet pacing from a vendor, and they deliver, delivered a solution. I think it was at Google. Um, so we put it into a kind of a canary deployment, and within a couple of days, we saw problems. And the problem was, in some extremely rare use case, um, rare being a relative thing that I'll explain in a minute, but in some extremely rare use case, we saw like a 100x spike in latency. So we went back to the vendor, 
and said, hey, we ran it and we're getting, you know, one out of a million, one out of a billion. I don't know what the ratio was, but we're getting these huge spikes in latency. Um, our primary interest in terms of performance, of course, the tail latency, but this is killing us. And the vendors, um, we tested it. Uh, we saw that. We didn't think it was a problem. Notice. And that's kind of the disconnects. And we, we talked about that this morning. Uh, vendors trying to do something uh, to appease software to make easy to use interface to, to provide the functionality. There's just no standards for this, no way to verify that. So this is kind of what I think is the fundamental problem with offload is it's just really hard to get that mismatch. Um, also, one other thing, if you look at kernel interfaces for offload, and what I did here was these are all of the uh, net dev flags, feature flags, just for GSO. So I don't know, there's like 30 of them. It, it's just crazy. So this is somehow features that have to be exposed by the driver to tell the kernel, yes, I support uh, UDP tunnel GSO or UDP tunnel CSOM GSO or this or this or this or this. It's not, not my word, but if you look at the documentation, this is called a mess. So NetDev features, um, we've known for a long time, it doesn't scale. I think at one point it went from 32 bits to 64 bits for the flag. But it's, it doesn't scale. I mean, they're, they're, I don't think anybody's going to argue this scales. Oh, and by the way, this is also a cross product of features, VLAN features, hardware and cap features, and MPLS features. So it's just a crazy number of possibilities. Uh, just had a, a great presentation on testing. How would you possibly test all of these combinations? So it's just not a great API. And I think that's one area we need to fix. Um, next problem is there are a lot of bugs in offload. Uh, I pointed out some of the very obvious ones just by reading the code yesterday and check some offload. I'm pretty convinced that almost every uh, driver or device that's doing protocol specific IPsec, IPv6 checks some offload probably fails completely miserably uh, when there's a routing header present. So there's a patch for that, um, but that that was just by reading the code. And again, routing headers, you know, probably not not many people are using them. Um, they are getting a little bit of traction. So what happens is uh, we get the code in, runs for a while, looks great, and then somebody tries to use this, and all of a sudden we broke a user. Um, and we have to go back and fix this. So we want to we want to catch those, but we also want to prevent those. Uh, last part. Uh, I think this was also kind of dis discussed this morning. It's just really hard to specify requirements uh, for NICs and NIC vendors. And the example I, I, I would use, so from OCP, there's a NIC core feature specification. Um, you know, on one hand, it's a great effort. Uh, I, I sympathize with the vendors. They want a standard uh, to implement against. Uh, Protocols have very specific standards. Uh, why not NICs? Problem is, so much of this is not amenable to being standardized. It's, it's like a moving target. And one line from that, which I think sums it up, when they're talking about offloading uh, generic receive offload grow, the end requirement after describing in prose the real normative requirement is match what they do in Linux version 6.3. So after all that, what it's saying is, well, the software is actually defines the standard. You have to match that. My claim is that's going to be true for all offloads. Um, and in fact, that takes us to the punchline. Um, so Jamel calls this the digital twin, but I think we want to actually make this a formalized requirement. So my claim is the functionality of a hardware offload must be exactly the same as that in the CPU offload, CPU software being offloaded. So the only way the kernel would ever trust 
an offload does the right thing is if it knows that that offload does the same thing it does. So the only way we could ever trust GRO is if the GRO offload is if the kernel knows that the, the device implements the same functionality. There's some caveats there in terms of resource, uh, resources, but functionally, we need this equivalency in order for offloads to work. So how do we fix this? Um, so let's go back, uh, kind of like David did this morning, let's go with some design principles. Uh, so we mentioned the fundamental offload requirement. That's great. Um, we need to we need to clean up the interfaces. So that means to a large extent simplifying this, uh, sim simplifying interfaces. To just have one uh, GSO flag, just have one uh, transmit checksum flag. Uh, we'll, we'll have to figure out how drivers can uh, that are limited can deal with that. But we really need to simplify the interfaces, and in doing that, we actually simplify the core stack. In some cases, that will push more complexity to the drivers. But as we talked about this morning, all the devices, all the drivers are different. So instead of trying to expose all those differences and let the kernel sort it out, it seems like it makes more sense that the drivers themselves figure out uh, the differences and let them sort it out themselves. So we can compartmentalize that. Uh, ends up with a much cleaner stack, much cleaner kernel, and we give uh, better guidance to the vendors on how to, to proceed. So part of that, though, is uh, at least on transmit, the driver looks at a packet, has to decide, can I offload this to the hardware? So in the simplest case, we're hoping um, uh, just look at the SK buff and give it a yes, no answer. Uh, in more complex cases, especially for legacy, that will mean um, cracking open the packet, looking to see what's in there. Uh, I think the, the protocol specific checksum offload um, with routing headers is a great example. We have to check if there's a routing header in the packet if the device doesn't understand routing headers. So for that though, um, definitely want to provide the proper helper functions. So we don't want to leave, uh, leave these guys out in the cold. So we want to provide helper functions, but we do want to get on the path where core, core kernel doesn't have to take all this load to somehow harmonize um, all these devices and, and the combinatorics of the various features they have. Another question is, when, um, when do you parse a packet? So in the best case scenario, uh, well, in the best, best case scenario, you, you would only parse a packet once, a uh, little hard to achieve with offloads. So my claim is on transmit, if you're sending a packet and you're parsing it in the device uh, in order to send that packet correctly, that probably means you have to parse it in the driver. So you're probably parsing it twice, whereas the kernel model is when you send no parsing. The idea is everything that uh, describes how to send that packet, including things like GSO and checksum, are contained in the SK bus. So the best model is on transmit. Just look at the uh, metadata in the SK buff, don't parse. Receive is a different story. Um, with, with one exception that I'll talk about, which I think is the receive checksum, pretty much for all offloads on the receive side, you actually do have to parse. Uh, grow, you're going to need to parse. Um, or you may offload, uh, is going to require parse. PC flower is going to require parsing. So, Turns out on the receive side, and parsing isn't just common, it's, it's almost ubiquitous. So that's a good point. So devices in general are gonna need to parse, tells me that's a commonality. So how can we make parsing itself something that's offloadable? So we uh, are gonna put a lot of effort into that. All of this though kind of depends on programmable devices. I think it's gonna be really, really hard to get to some ubiquitous offloads to fix them without having some sort of programmability in the device. And I think it's more programmability, the better, obviously. So if we're saying that we want offloads that can match kernel functionality, kind of obvious, then we want uh, something that 
program to match that functionality. It's the best case scenario. That's not to say that all of the functions inside of the hardware um, are written in, in code. Uh, we can use accelerators and speed ups, but what it says is the logic, particularly the logic of an offload, want to be programmable, uh, and that gives us the best chance to make these ubiquitous. Uh, so with that, um, I want to cover uh, the five basic offloads. Uh, these are representative of the offloads. Uh, they're also interesting because these have the most legacy. So in some sense, they're actually harder to fix than even some of the newer offloads because there's not as much legacy there. But it does give us uh, kind of the roadmap. Uh, how do we get to more complex functionality, more complex offloads? Uh, I'd like to get back to TCP offload and things like that. But in order to do that, I think we have to, have to get the basics under control. So checksum offload, um, one of my favorites. Uh, a while back in 2016, I think uh, Dave Miller at some, a NetDev gave a presentation called Less is More. And the conclusion was protocol-specific checksum offloads uh, are deprecated. And if you look in the kernel and the comments in skbuff.h, sure enough, you'll see that. So not clear to me that the vendors really, all the vendors have gotten on board with that. Um, but I believe it's been, a long, it, it's been long enough. Protocol-specific checksum offloads, we've already talked about the, uh, the transmit bugs. On the receive side, there are similar issues. Uh, they don't work in so many cases, encapsulations, um, certain uh, extension headers. They, they limited us. Um, they had their time. At one point, it made sense when packets were simple. But nowadays, things are much more complex. Protocol agnostic took some offload. So clean, uh, it just works. It's, it's like, I think the only case a truly, um, call it simple, check some offload. We don't have to worry about parsing the packet or anything like that. So the goal here is uh, basically to eliminate protocol-specific uh, checksum offloads from the kernel. So we want to get rid of NetF uh, FIP checksum, IPv6 checksum, uh, checksum flag, and also uh, checksum unnecessary. So. Obviously, we can't just rip those out and expect uh, all the devices to adapt to them. So what we do is uh, we can take them out of the core kernel and we'll provide um, helper functions. Uh, some of those are already there and, and actually kind of being used for this purpose. But we'll provide the helper functions, and that makes it clear. So we now have legacy uh, device support. Uh, new devices, um, you know, they, they're still recommended. Use uh, Use checksum complete, use NetF hardware checksum. So that's, in a, I mean, it sounds easy, obviously, but I think that's, uh, that's one of the goals we have. Uh, RSS, uh, it's kind of interesting that Jakob mentioned that today. Uh, I actually do think RSS is an offload of RPS. Um, RSS has worked great, except it suffers from a lot of the same problems as the other offloads. Only works with packet formats that the device is programmed to do. And since it's hard coded, it only works with packet formats. So if we create new forms of encapsulation and we want to go into those encapsulations to get the hash device, if it's not programmable, it only gives us the outer, um, outer information. Mostly works. But again, you know, for scalability, for future proof, I think we want to take that in. Now, the good news about this is this is very dependent on the programmable parser. Uh, we, are, we already mentioned that has applicability for almost all the offloads. So the majority of that work to kind of convert it to be protocol agnostic is really in the parser anyway. So uh, that makes, it seems to me that that's uh, pretty reasonable. Um, the key there, though, uh, thinking about parsers is actually be flow detector. So last or two, last NetDev or NetDev before I, I gave the presentation on flow detector DBTF, that is still in play, um, and there's various reasons we're going to want to do that. But 
that is part of the uh, segue into solving the RSS uh, problem. Uh, to round it off, uh, GSO, I already mentioned the, the mess of the API. Uh, that's just something that we need to clean up and we can use similar, similar techniques. So what you'd want to do there is uh, stack uh, looks, device can do GSO, send the packet, and then it's up to the device to figure out if it can actually do uh, the GSO. So if you can do GSO in a very generic way, then uh, probably can do it. If it has constraints, only does certain protocols, does it does UDP tunneling, but no UDP tunneling with checksum, then you can look into the packet and figure it out. Uh, we don't want to carry all that information inside the SK buff because that gets us back into uh, the, the feature explosion. So let the device or let the driver look at it. Uh, if you're worried about actually parsing the packet, in a sense, it's not too bad. Uh, the data is probably already in the cache, so I'm not overly worried about it. But I think the trade off here to clean up the kernel and put everybody on or move the direction of the needle into a more generic device path, I think it's worth it. Uh, so we want to get rid of as many GSO flags as possible. Uh, and then on Jiro, and that almost comes down to being mostly an issue of being able to parse. But the other part is we do need to implement the logic of GRO. And, and I think this is where we got in trouble with LRO. Uh, there's timers, there's eviction, there's uh, policies around the push bit. All of those, kernel does a great job. Um, it can do grow on almost anything, probably does. Uh, but how do you get that into into a device logic? Uh, this is really where we start to see we, we kind of need this to be really programmable. It's going to be virtually impossible to pull off uh, a ubiquitous uh, LRO or GROW without having a programmable device, um, especially with the protocols. Uh, so I want to go down into a little bit. I do want to get to Felipe shortly. Um, so, Felipe, if you're listening, uh, just be prepared. So, as I mentioned, uh, the fundamental offload requirement is that we have the same functionality in the kernel and in the device. So, the obvious way to do that is have them somehow run the same code. So, we talked about this yesterday in, uh, I think, the TC, TC workshop. How do you do this? Well, the, the um, best way, or at least a proposed way, let's start with the same source code uh, written in your favorite language, uh, and write in P4 or C or something. Um, but let's either tag that with a hash, or preferably, I would like to compile it into some intermediate representation, take a hash of that. And then from that, generate various backend targets. One of them, say is eBPF. Uh, say we're doing, uh, we want to do flow to sector or offload. So let's have eBPF, um, write it in C, uh, use uh, um, some of the techniques that we showed last time. You can write it in C, compile it into eBPF, that's downloadable into the kernel. That eBPF image also includes the hash of the source code, so it carries it. Then let's compile that into some hardware device. Uh, maybe an NPU or P4, or maybe the hardware device is some sort of CPU on the data path. So it doesn't matter from that point of view. All that matters is we can compile that program into that target that supports the same functionality as a source code, tag it, and then through a separate means, we'll download it um, into the device. Now it's just a matter of when uh, can the kernel match its run through what the device is running. And if they match, then the kernel has that assurance, modulo the device's line or bugs, uh, have you. But it has a pretty strong assurance if it's a strong hash. This is very likely the same functionality. So the offload becomes um, tangible. And this is, I think, for offloads, the way to solve the visibility problem that we mentioned this morning. Uh, so this is uh, actually um, paraphrasing uh, an email from Jakob on the P4TC. 
but he gave the uh, nine steps, or I think it originally had eight steps, uh, how to do offloads. Uh, start with uh, writing in a language and then compiling it and downloading it and um, you can use lib firmware. So there were those steps. Um, just added the part about uh, the hash. So in order to to compare. So Felipe will talk a little bit more about the um, pragmatics of that uh, in a moment. So I think that's my last slide. I uh, just wanted to give the status. So this work is underway. Um, we're starting with the sexual offload. Um, trying to do the normal incremental approach in Linux. And we actually have to kind of backtrack. There are some prerequisites uh, we need to fix. Um, as I mentioned, we need to fix uh, drivers that can't support uh, checksum offload with routing headers. Uh, CRC offload is kind of an interesting one. There are a few drivers that support this. But the odd thing is, this is still checksum unnecessary. So checksum unnecessary, unfortunately, has a couple of overloaded things that we do have to fix. Uh, one is it can be unnecessary for SCTP CRC or checksum. Uh, the other one that's kind of interesting that I discovered, which um, is going to be a bug based on some other work we did, uh, checksum unnecessary may actually mean that the checksum is incorrect, but don't worry about it. Like ignore the checksum. So there's one use case when we have a transport mode IPsec uh, and that IP, IP addresses change on the outer header. When we do the IPsec, we get the inner header. Um, because of that, checksum is now completely messed up. So nobody figured out how to do the checksum. So, I think there's going to be cases where you'll hit a bug on this. If you're doing a UDP checksum unnecessary conversion with IPsec transport header through NAT, it'll fail. Anybody doing that? I know there are some out of tree uh, cellular network drivers that do checksum unnecessary after corrupting the checksum. So just FYI. Yeah. So. Um, it's not great. So for other reasons, getting rid of checksum unnecessary is, I'm, I'm, we need to replace it with like checksum ignore, but those drivers that are setting checksum unnecessary now and checksum level, uh, they will be better off going to checksum. Um, so I was wondering for the hardware for the offload, where you were saying that you need the same code, how does that work when you have an ASIC that's implemented this at a hardware level, not programmable? Are you saying we just dump that? You mean know, a more advanced offload or? Like, theoretically, you could implement checksumming offloading at an ASIC level, like a very low level hardware. And so then you are not compiling C code. This has been implemented in like VHDL. So check, check some, well, checksum offload itself is like the one I would say that's one offload that you don't compile for. It's so simple, and it can be standardized. On transmit, very specific. You have uh, offsets where the checksum begins. You have an offset to write the checksum. So it's easy, even easier. Just give me the ones complement sum starting from the beginning of the packet through the end. And I mean, remember when we did the um, let they did is, is less is more. In a sense, it's so simple. Some of the vendors, the marketing people at vendors, they couldn't grasp grasp it. Like, no, we have to provide multiple checks on the packet and this and that. And we're telling them, no, simple. This one particular case, like the easiest thing in the world, but makes it more complex by trying to be smart about it. I think that's what it's saying. That being said, checks on offload obviously is part of more advanced offload, which gets in PSO. Yeah, it's a little bit more complicated because now every single segment I need to do an independent checksum. But we can should still be able to represent that in a very generic way. But for offloads in general, like even if you get into encryption or something like that, are you saying that we should avoid ASIC implementations for something that's programmable? Yeah. Um, so 
would you, I mean, is anybody ever going to try to put TCP into an ASIC again? It's a, uh, a nightmare. Um, and that, obviously, that, that's kind of uh, ridiculous, that complex. But let's look at something like TC Flower. Uh, how, do you, how do you hard code all the protocols you ever need into an ASIC? So the, the proliferation of protocols, especially custom protocols, uh, unless you're willing to do, you know, U32, but that's so hard to generalize. To me, it's uh, pretty quickly, at least on the receive side, it's going to be hard not to have some. And that's even before you have the logic of something as complex like Falcon. But, you know, my, my point is, we're, we're not starting from day one. We have uh, 30 years of history of this. Um, we can look at the successes, um, but. Honestly, there's a long list of failed offloads. I mean, very few of them became ubiquitous. And this, this may or may not work, but we have to try. And you know, one thing that change, has changed in the past few years, uh, and this is, this is going to have more and more impact, devices are becoming more programmable, more, more flexible. Now, they're not necessarily open up the firmware, they're at least giving us something to program, and hopefully not through some proprietary SDK, but using something more standard. I think that's going to be um, the enabler of this. Thanks. Okay, so uh, can we go to Felipe?